Um, but I'm firmly convinced, and it's like a drug. So if you ever have tried it out yourself, you don't want to go back to passwords anymore. Welcome, one and all, to the Startup Knockout Podcast. I'm your host, Timo Hicks. Today, we have Vincent Delitz, CEO of Corbato, uh, a startup that is working to kill passwords, which is something I think we can all look forward to. And he's going to teach us about that today. So thank you for coming on the show today, Vincent. Thanks for, for having me, Timo. So we're going to jump right into a bit about you. So you're the CEO of Corbato and you're one of the co-founders, but you have quite an impressive list of companies that you've worked with. I'm seeing KPMG here. I'm seeing Lufthansa, Boston Consulting Group, even Celonis, which for anybody listening to this outside of Germany is kind of a startup rock star right now. What made you want to leave that track record behind and start your own company? It's, it's a very well, uh, a very good question. And uh, actually like almost a year ago, I, I was um, posing me the same question because I was at the end of my studies and I had like several specific offers to start working at uh, consulting companies or also industry. But also what I really liked uh, much in my, my past was working as a freelance consultant or contractor or freelance software engineer. Um, besides that, I also had like a previous uh, first venture uh, which failed eventually. But during this like um, independent working time at uh, First Row, the first venture, and also like uh, as a freelancer, I learned so many new things that I asked myself, okay, um, I know 25, um, I have no real, um, no real family, I have no real um, specific high costs that I have to cover. Why shouldn't I just try it out and try to build something on my own? Because the bar is quite low if I fail. And even if it uh, fails like in two or three years, I can still uh, start to look for a casual job at uh, any company. So that's actually why I thought, okay, let's just give it a try and see how things will work out eventually. Yeah. Uh, failure is cheap early on in your career. I understand that. True. Absolutely. Yeah. And you mentioned first row. This was your first attempt at a startup. And... This is not uncommon nowadays. In fact, I hear investors are starting to look for people who have already had a first experience so that they understand the startup world better and they've already got the learnings under their belt. Um, take us through a few of those learnings. What are some of the things, concrete things that you learned at first row that you took with you into Carbato? So let's distinguish between like uh, small successes we had and also like the big mistakes, the failures actually where you learn most from. I really look for a team um, and members um, and colleagues or employees um, who I really like to spend time with because obviously in a startup, you need to spend a lot of time with your team and it's like of the, one of the things that is most crucial in the early days. And also like on the topic side, I was looking for a thing or a specific topic or industry where I'm really passionate about, where I can also relate uh, very much myself. But back then at first row, um, I made, or we made so many mistakes. Uh, first of all, we had no real experience in the space. So it was like a, a media company. We were kind of like in the edutainment space, but none of us had actually worked in that area before. It was a B2C approach and none of us had ever worked in, in B2C. We were all like um, more experienced in B2B working as consultants or also as software engineers in that area. So that was kind of the first thing, okay, you, you really need to experience the pain, the problems and um, so, so forth on your own to, to bring a valuable solution to the market. Besides, um, also back then we were all like students, we had kind of a very, let's say, scientific approach. So all different options that we had for specific decisions, they need to, to be really well um, evaluated before we actually executed one. We came up with a huge business plan and also like our market sizing Excel template was massive but um, actually it, it didn't bring us much uh, value in in the end because um, in startups and also that's like of the biggest earnings you just need to do things you just need to experiment you need to talk to real customers uh, see what they're thinking about the product what kind of issues they have today and don't just overthink it like university or also science often teaches you just do it and see how things will eventually go yeah it sounds like you were approaching it your first time like you would approach a consulting project yeah, at BCG, that's... which is, I, I, I suppose, it's not necessarily a bad thing because consultants are fantastic at gathering a lot of information to help you make the best decision possible, but it's not always the information that's necessary for startups. 
Now, you mentioned decision making there. It's something I'm very interested in is how companies make decisions. And I'm wondering, have you changed that at all? How you make decision with your team from when you were in first row to now in Corbato? How, what's your process like for making really important decisions? Um, back at first row, we, we try to gather as much information as possible, try to model different scenarios. Okay, what could happen in, in case A, case B, and case C? Uh, we try to actually minimize the risk um, when, when taking a decision. Now at Corbado, um, I would say we also, of course, try to gather as much information and try to minimize the risk, but we are more like open for failure. So um, if we just try something out and if it doesn't work eventually, I mean, we are a startup, it's, it's okay to fail or it's okay to um, just go a different direction the next week. Um, because if you just spend time on discussing on how you could do things, you're not actually getting any real feedback and uh, any, I mean, you need feedback from real customers, from real problems in order to improve your product and also to make it actually like a viable solution that could last for, for many years to come. Make everyone at your startup comfortable with a certain level of failure so you can get those mistakes out of the way and get to the successes faster. I think that's very wise. Now let's talk about risk, but in a different way. You guys are a digital security. And the first question that people always want to ask when we're talking about digital security is how much at risk am I as an individual or as a business? What do those risks look like in the modern world? So I would say um, like cyber risks, um, they're constantly growing. I mean, due to the COVID pandemic, uh, things have actually accelerated and you're uh, more at risk than ever before, I would say. So many things are digitized nowadays, um, either in, in the business world, but also like in the private world. Uh, you're doing so many things online. You have so many different accounts. You're using so many digital services. So on the other hand side, I mean, also like the kind of attacks or the kind of uh, threats they have also evolved. Um, and they are getting more like um, a, a real human or they getting humanized uh, how, how, or however you, you want to call it. Because like 10, 50 years ago, it was quite obvious if you got a phishing mail or if there was like a, a site that, that looked malicious that you could detect it. But now as technology evolves, if it's uh, getting like also like an AI layer on top that can just mimic um, human behavior, it's often quite hard to distinguish between if it's a legitimate uh, website or a legitimate request or if it's something malicious. So actually technology always changed. And as uh, I also think um, the weakest link in, in everything is always the human in front of a smartphone, in front of a PC. But if you are like an individual, it's most of the time the case that cyber criminals are trying to target you, they're trying to trick you into giving some, some uh, providing some confidential information. So like this human, this user um, experience layer is kind of the thing that I see now is, is very attractive for many cyber uh, criminals to, um, uh, to attack. And also that's what we as Corbado are, are focusing in order to, to just improve the defense on, on that level. Huh. Do you yourself have sort of like a go-to thing that you're looking for? Let's say you get an email and you get a feeling that it might not be quite right What's the first one or two things that you check? First of all, I mean, you can always look who, who has sent you the email, but you can easily spoof that nowadays. So that's like one of the first things that I check. Um, then the next thing that I check, are there any suspicious links inside them? Are they like kind of spare, uh, trying to spare fish me? So it's, is it like a attack that is particularly targeted towards myself? So is there something like hi, Vincent, in the, in the subject or uh, in, the, in the email body? if you're getting sent an email that you don't really expect. So always try to um, be suspicious because eventually this will pay out. Yeah, vigilance, constant vigilance. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about your solution now. Corbato offers pass keys that you say will kill passwords. So first, tell us what the problem is with passwords and how are pass keys meant to solve that? Passwords are one of the or the most uh, prevalent authentication method nowadays. I mean, everyone's familiar with the concept. You provide a username or email and then also like a password to access an online service, a web app or a native application. The thing is of passwords, they should be complex. You should have a different one for each server or application that you're using. And you also should change them frequently. But most people 
they just can't remember such a massive amount of uh, different like complicated passwords that they change it so they take like simple ones for instance like their their pet's name and it also they reuse it over a variety of services so it's a huge security vulnerability the thing is if you provide a password to one service and this one service is being packed it's quite easy for someone else if he just um, comes up with your email address, which is an often, uh, in many cases, available via a simple Google search. And uh, they can just try to also use this password um, that they have obtained for the correct service on another service. And this is called credential staffing, which is a huge problem, especially for many B2C um, companies. Besides that, with passwords, um, like before mentioned, it's always um, like the email, the phishing email, the famous one that you get, you're tricked into a site, which just looks pretty much like the original site. You enter your password, it's being stolen and someone accesses your account. So people or companies came up with solutions like password managers, but in my opinion, a password manager is definitely a good uh, thing to protect yourself, but it's like a solution for, for the symptoms. So, um, you still need to provide a password. You still need to set up a password manager. And many, especially non-technical people, are not too familiar with setting up a password manager or syncing the password manager through their smartphones, their laptops, their tablets. So it's actually still quite um, a struggle for you in order to um, access your service securely if all of them are um, based on passwords. I mean, who, who likes to remember passwords? Who likes to manage them? It's just a necessary thing you need to do. But I know no one who will ask them to, to remember. Every password should be different and it should be complex. It is impossible now to remember those passwords if you're using strong passwords. So yeah, uh, using the password managers, as you said, I have to tell you, uh, I don't know which of my passwords is in my password managing software and which of them I've just saved to my Chrome browser. And that annoys the hell out of me. Absolutely agree. Okay, so tell us uh, tell us what passkeys are. Passkeys, they are a completely different approach to uh, user authentication. So in one simple sentence, they actually combine the easiness of face ID, touch ID, so biometrics that you're already familiar with, with the security of asymmetric cryptography that prevents all sorts of password-based attacks. So let's break that down. Um, first of all, passkeys, um, like this user friendly uh, thing with face ID, touch ID, what does it mean? It actually means you can use your um, authentication that you already use for accessing and unlocking your smartphone, for instance, now also on websites, on web apps and native apps. Besides that, there's like the security aspect that you don't have a shared secret anymore. So there's no like password that you have to remember or put in your password manager. And it also like a service or uh, has to store in a database that could potentially be breached. So instead they're using some on a public and a private uh, cryptographic key, which is highly secure. So I go to Facebook, I put in my username, I put in my password, I go in. Now, if you're using passkeys, how is that different? From a user experience perspective, it's, it's quite easy. You just enter your email address as you do it now, and then comes something like a passkey prompt. So this is the Face ID, Touch ID, Windows Hello, Android Biometrics prompt that you're familiar with. You put on your finger or you scan your face, and that's it. So all technical aspects, all the cryptography is completely hidden from the user. And there's nothing or there was no moment where you had to enter a password, where you had to look into your password manager. You're just getting redirected to the locked in uh, page of Facebook. So it's basically like opening my phone nowadays. So either I'm exactly. using my thumbprint or I'm using my face. And every now and again, it will prompt me for my passcode. But most of the time, I don't need that. So most of the time, I'm using a pass key to get into my phone. Absolutely. Okay. That makes it nice and simple. Um, so this, I, I want to separate a, a little bit of the, the jargon. Um, is this the same thing as OAuth? Because I think I understand OAuth, but I'm not sure. So can you help me out a little? So the most common thing is that there's like a social login. So you can log in with Facebook, you can log in with Google on different websites. So if you go, for instance, on your favorite e-commerce site and you want to log into your account, you can click on Login with Google and you're being redirected to the Google page. You um, most of the times are logged in already. You just um, approve um, the whole flow and you're getting redirected back to your e-commerce site. Passkeys, even though they uh, make use of like syncing uh, via Google, Apple and Microsoft, they are completely independent of that flow. So it's a completely different principle. 
and also with social logins, there was in some step, uh, uh, there was a step where you had to enter a password. So for the initial setup of your Facebook or Google account, you had to provide a password. As I said, passwords, they rely on shared secrets and pass keys have like this different cryptographic approach. Okay. Yeah, that makes it a lot clearer. Now, getting back to Corbato and the services you provide. So as I understand it, one of your main selling points is not just providing passkey services, but the sign-up process and the transition process from the old system onto the passkey system, and that you are smoothing this out. Give us an understanding of what that means and why that's so important for your customers. Yes. So actually, when I first came in contact with passkeys or the underlying standard, which is called WebAuthN or FIDO2, I thought, okay, this is pretty awesome. Let's just add it to my existing application. So um, I started to run my application. I started to, to code. I looked into the documentation and thought, okay, it shouldn't take longer than maybe a day or something like that to actually incorporate it into my application. But things turned out to be quite complex, and it's been a complex journey which took several months, and it's still ongoing. So the thing why it's so complicated because is because authentication nowadays is so complex um, compared to like 10 or 15 years ago. Back then, you had mainly a desktop computer and email and passwords. But nowadays, modern applications, they are accessed by smartphones, tablets, by desktops from Google, Apple, Android devices. You have social logins. Sometimes you have passwordless options like email magic links or one-time passcodes. Then there is something like two-factor authentication and it's heavily complex already today. And now there comes passkeys. Passkeys, they're sort of device bound. So they're kind of bound to your smartphone, to your to a laptop, to your MacBook. And this is just getting so complex. It's like a potential increase in the complexity of authentication. And the other thing is you already have like these users who are just uh, used to log in with their passwords and you need to somehow transition them to use passkeys. And integrating that into existing applications is a journey that takes bigger companies, as they estimate, three to six months, and they need to um, set. Uh, they need to um, spend. Um, uh, they need to spend like money for several full-time engineers to work on that. And I thought myself, okay, passkeys is such a game changer in authentication. And if every company who uses passwords nowadays, which is like 99% of the applications and companies, need to go through this exercise. Uh, exercise, we need to provide a solution that is just easy to add to your existing system. So there's no major migration project, no major change to a running system required. And you can just add pass keys as a very smart and thin, lightweight authentication layer on top. So that's how we build our solutions that developers can integrate it in one hour. They can keep all their authentication and systems in place and just add it on our solution on top. Mm -hmm. So you're thinking in terms of two user profiles. So the user profile of the end user, they need to use the passkeys, but also your user profile of the developers who actually need to integrate this and you're smoothing that user experience for them. And I'm sure there's a lot of developers around the world that are going to be thanking you for that. So you're a fairly young company, but you're moving very quickly. What are you focused on right now as a company? So kind of, as you've said, one of our target groups are software developers who integrate our solution. And we just want to make the integration for them as smooth and as easy as possible. So we're focusing a lot on providing good documentation, providing like uh, wizards who help them to integrate it into their different tech stacks so that it can really be done within one hour. Besides that, as pass keys are always like a technology that has a uh, consumer interface. So people need to authenticate with the face ID or touch ID. You need to be really well in, in user experience. You, know, you need to describe, okay, what steps come. You need to detect what kind of device is that. Do I know the user? Is the device passkey ready? And you need to communicate that to the users. So we're putting a lot of effort into creating an intelligent solution, just provides the best user experience for passkey first authentication. After you began to expand outside of the founder team. What was your first hire? One of the first ones who we started to work with us uh, was actually more on the distribution side on, on talking to like product managers, software developers. So what kind of uh, things, what kind of um, aspects are you concerned or 
uh, are you concerned with in, in authentication or have you ever heard of pass keys? Bringing someone in who is able to talk to potential customers, reach out to them and get all these challenges with pass keys or authentication in general back into our product was one of the first hires like uh, we made. Then last question about this. So what do you see now going forward, next six to 12 months, maybe 18 months, what are your main challenges and how are you attacking them? I'm 100% convinced this, this, that this will be the future of, authentica uh, of authentication. But so far, there are very few bigger companies like eBay or PayPal, who were kind of like the first movers, who provide pass keys to a wider audience. So it's still a lot of education uh, that you need to do. You need to tell people, okay, it's way more secure. Your biometrics are not being sent to any server. It's only stored on your device. And it's so much smoother than using passwords. So kind of the first big challenge is like, how fast will this pass key adoption be? The next thing is actually, um, we are also trying to figure out how can we help companies um, who are starting from the green field. So we're kind of building like an entirely passwordless new application. So also coming up with products that they can use um, and they don't have like any legacy systems in place. And also on the other hand side, providing like these aforementioned migration services. So how can we help companies and customers who want to use their existing user base and don't want to change their whole system, but provide pass keys on top. How can we serve them? Uh -huh. And talking about the adoption thing, getting companies who already have legacy systems to adopt this, what are some of the things that need to happen in order for them to adopt? Is this strictly an educational thing? They need to understand the technology or are there other barriers in place? I think... From, from a technology perspective, um, there are some things that are currently not yet fully supported. So, for instance, Microsoft has not fully rolled out uh, like a passkey synchronization feature that many people actually wait on. And there are also some things if you have like cross-platform or cross-device processes. So, coming um, here with your iPhone and then wanting to log in with a passkey on your Windows laptop is still um, kind of uh, a struggle for many companies. And you need to come up with solutions for, for these specific use cases. But on the other hand side, it's like um, that we see many companies who are kind of risk averse. They just don't want to overwhelm their users. They um, ha say, okay, we, we just want to see bigger tech companies, for instance, like the Airbnb, which uh, a lot of consumers use to deploy pass keys to their end users. And then we can just learn from their best demonstrated practices. So what kind of messaging are you using? Are you offering pass keys only to users who have already a password? Or are you also offering pass keys to new users who sign up and even without providing a password at any time? So kind of these things are still kind of uncertain. There are some early movers, as I said, eBay, PayPal, or also Kayak, um, but I'm firmly convinced and it's like a drug. So if you ever have tried it out yourself, you don't want to go back to passwords anymore. So it's really addictive. Uh, I mean, you can try it out um, on our website as a free demo. Um, and just uh, compare it to the password experience that you are used uh, to from other websites. That's right. I remember I, I went and took a look at that and checked to see if my devices can use pass keys um, on your website. You have that, that detection tool. Now, you mentioned uh, some companies are risk averse and they're kind of taking a wait and see approach. The German Mittelstand is famously risk averse. So are you focusing mainly on the German market or is it international and whoever needs you and comes to you will be your customer? So yeah, it's like, as I said, two-sided. On the one hand side, talking to a lot of companies here from the German speaking area, but also like due to the global presence and also to especially North America, where we see many companies who are more willing to take risks and who are uh, who want to be like the first movers globally also and providing pass keys. Uh, it's also quite interesting talking to people from from there. It's funny that we're phrasing this as the company is taking a risk in order to reduce their risk. That feels very ironic. Let's talk about let's talk about Germany a little bit more then. So the German startup scene is something we always like to talk about. You're kind of integrated into the local startup scene, but you're not making a lot of efforts to, you know, get to know everybody and find out all the resources that are available in the Munich startup scene. Um, why do you feel that that is not so necessary for you guys and that you don't really need it to enable what you're planning to do? Yeah, I mean, um, as you said, we're, we're not part of any official hubs, accelerators, program, incubators, stuff like that, because we said, okay, 
uh, let's just focus on on creating a great product and talking to real customers because from my past experience i often gained kind of the impression that many of these programs they are good for for other companies especially like b2c companies or if you have like no experience at all uh, then it's a good thing to actually get a jump start but um, in our case we said okay we are pretty confident if you talk to people to customers to the companies directly without wasting time on other things like um, any any informal rounds um, it's more valuable to the overall um, venture so we decided okay if we apply for an accelerator then it's a very very specific one and let's just use our scarce resources so many our time the founders time to really focus on the things that um, are valuable sure yeah i guess that makes sense if if you don't have any experience if you don't already have connections to talented well-informed people then an accelerator makes a lot of sense but if you already have those connections then why spend the time? Because as you said, that's probably your most scarce resource right now is time. And speaking of which, the time has come to play win, lose, or draw. I'm going to give Vincent a few concepts, a few topics, and he's going to tell me if he thinks it's a winner, which means he's either predicting it will happen or he thinks it's a really good thing or both. Or if it's a loser and it's not going to happen, it's not a good thing, and he gives us a reason why, or if it's a draw and it's a wait and see. So Vincent, are you ready to play win, lose, or draw? Yes, I am. Fantastic. So win, lose, or draw, chat GPT and other large language models making it easier for cyber criminals to enter cyber crime by lowering the barrier to entry. I would say it's a draw. So on the one hand side, uh, as we already talked uh, before, attacks are getting more sophisticated people are getting easier tricked into like phishing emails because ai is just like a, a human you talk to but on the other hand side like the defense sector is also being trained so they are ai algorithms who are getting improved constantly on who can detect like malicious emails or any cyber threats it's nice to know that the cyber police are getting better trained second one win loser draw passwords die completely and they become one of those things you tell your kids about where your kids have no idea what you're talking about. I, I wish that it is a win, but I think it will be a draw because in some cases, especially like in more consumer oriented cases, which like especially mobile devices, they will hopefully completely die sooner. Um, but in other cases, if you have like more like desktop users or users who like the digital dinosaurs, it will take more years to come until passwords are fully replaced by other authentication methods. So I would say it's a draw. So last one, win, loser, draw, Corbato being the ones to kill passwords. I'm firmly convinced that it will be a win, but it's not like there's only one startup that will succeed in this industry because we are happy with every password that is being killed. In, in my thinking, it's like that an entire industry will succeed. And I firmly believe that we play uh, role in it and I think killing passwords is just for greater good there's so many other great companies working on this problem uh, uh, but I'm as I said fully convinced that we can play a role in ditching passwords forever and making people's lives easier and also people's lives uh, more secure good so that was win lose or draw and that brings us to the end of our episode thank you so much Vincent these were fantastic answered I learned a lot from this one so I really appreciate you coming on and I hope we can have you on again sometime and we can give us an update on how Corbato has been doing and how dead passwords are sure thanks Timo for having me once again and looking forward for our follow-up podcast episode fantastic until then take care everyone this has been our discussion with Vincent Delitz Thanks to everyone for joining us this week. Be sure to look for us on social media. We're at Startup Knockout. We're on Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, and TikTok. Take care, everyone, and we'll see you next week.